Um, they asked me, uh, I was coming here for social reasons uh, this week, and they said, well, while you're here, why don't you give a talk? So I'm like, okay, I'll bring a tie and a jacket, and I'll put something together. And I said, what would you be interested in? And they said, well, talk about uh, clinical research informatics. And so I, I'm going to summarize some of the things we're doing at UAB. There's a big group there. We have a CTSA program, the Center for Clinical Translational Science, and the Informatics Institute, and we work very closely together. There's a lot of overlap, and uh, so I'll talk about a bunch of those things. I had to present some uh, objectives early on when you use these funny verbs, recall, recognize, uh, judge, appraise. So you're going to have to do all these things at the end of this talk. But the stuff in red is the important stuff, and I added a couple more things to the to the uh, original list as I thought about things I would talk about. So I'm going to talk a lot about I2B2. Um, I, hopefully that's something that resonates here. How many people know, know I2B2? How many people use, it, use I2B2? Okay. So um, I can go through some of that quickly, but we've done some innovative things with I2B2 that I can talk about. I want to talk about the accrual to clinical trials um, ontology that we're, um, we want to work with and then talk about some work we're doing to help tra uh, support translational team science. And then finally talk about a grant proposal that's going to be reviewed this week or next week at uh, NCATS that we're doing actually with, um, with uh, Umberto and Anita. Okay, so you know what I2B2 is. In our site, we have a Cerner impact system. Uh, we do an ETL process. We put it into the Cerner Enterprise Data Warehouse. It's called Power Insight. And then we have EDW analysts who go and get the data. So researchers who need the data typically have to go to the analyst, uh, wait two weeks or so to get an answer from the analyst, and then they talk to the analyst, and the analyst gets some, some data a week later, and they go, this isn't what I want. And then they go, oh, what did, why didn't, why didn't you, what you said? No, but I meant this. So then they go back and forth for a couple of weeks, and eventually they get their data. So the idea is that I2B2, by having the same data or a subset of the data, can be a self-service way to shortcut that process. And we do, and we've done that fairly successfully. People will go in, identify a cohort of interest, and then they can go to the analyst and say, okay, I figured out who I'm interested in, now please pull these data from the record that may or may not be an I2B2, but they, they're all in the enterprise data warehouse. And then we have connections out to uh, some shrine networks, the ACT network, uh, and uh, other, uh, actually, we, we have a subset of the ACT network, the Southeast Shrine network that we, um, but it's been actually subsumed by ACT, and then we're connected with Trinetics as well. So this is just, I don't know if you can read those, um, it's just some, some big numbers of the kind of stuff we have in there, typical, you know, labs, medications, um, that sort of thing. We're starting to work on putting in notes and being able to de-identify the notes so you can go in and search against de-identified notes. Big number there is lab orders, so 141 million of those, 48 million blood pressures. And now um, here's kind of the growth of our, our data. And the big spike there is because we have the Alabama Genome Health Initiative, which is sort of our... Uh, all of us project, if you know what the all of us project is to collect um, samples from 10,000 patients, patients in Alabama and sequence them. And we're starting to add that sequence data into I2B2. I'll show you that a little later. This is the terminology. Some of it expanded out and we have a lot of data that comes from other sources, uh, cancer registry and so on. We've added a lot of data on um, uh, uh, you know, health disparities data. Uh, uh, social determinants of health and disease, those kinds of things are being added. And so that you can go in and say, find me all the patients mm -hmm. who live in a, a census tract where this social determinant is predominant. So we don't know exactly who's gone to college or who lives in a high crime street, but we know if you live in a census tract, then you live in an area that is also associated with high crime and we can make those associations. Okay, so to use I2B2, we, we, we have a certification process for I2B2. And even though the typical use of I2B2 is just to get summary data, um, we want people to get all the certification for human subjects research, um, responsible conduct research, HIPAA, and computer security and all that stuff. So they have to get certification. And so it's a typical stuff. But we add one extra thing, and I'll, and I'll show you that and then talk about why we do that. And it's called the uh, Restrictions on Limited Data Set Use. So a limited data set, you would probably think of it as a de-identified data set. That is, you look at it and it has no identifiers, but it has dates in it. Dates are considered identifiers because they could be re used to re-identify people, um, supposedly, more than anything else. Like your, your ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes are probably a fingerprint of you in a database, and you could be uniquely identified based on the codes that you had for there. But be that as it may, 
those are not considered identifiers, but dates are. So um, we have this thing, and this is our learning management system, and you go in there and you look up the course, the, and you find the course, and the course consists of reading this document and then answering and taking a test. And the test has one question, and the answer is yes. Uh, and basically, you're just acknowledging that you you agree to follow that um, that the restrictions on use of limited data sets, which basically says I won't give these data to anybody else. I won't try to re-identify the patients. I won't try to recontact the patients. Um, and then it's it's very simple. And I'll talk about why we did that. So type what we now call for the IRB, we had to kind of break it down into levels or types so they would understand we were talking about. Type one is summary data, not human subjects data, and that's the typical use of I2B2. So this is a, a query into I2B2 for um, patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease and um, a bunch of different um, proton pump inhibitors, and we found 25,000 patients. Um, here's one where instead of using the individual codes, I used the class proton pump inhibitor, inhibitor I got another 5,000 patients. And then once you do that, uh, oh, and then you, so you guys are familiar with I2B2. You can add all these other parameters. This is all pretty standard stuff. And then once you've done a query, you can get the aggregated data. You can probably write some kind of paper about the population, of, uh, you know, the, uh, the traits of a population, when gender. We have pretty good race and ethnicity data, which I thought was kind of standard. But when I, I found some patterns I was interested in, and I went to Harvard and Columbia and Vanderbilt and said, hey, are you guys seeing this, these racial patterns? in your data and they, they all said, yeah, we don't really have good racial data on our patients. I was very surprised. So, um, but we, we pay a lot of attention to that in Alabama for good reasons. Um, okay, so that's type one summary data. So type two, we have added a module to uh, I2B2 that allows you to download limited data sets. Now, normally to get a limited data set, most places you fill out a form to the IRB, ask for an exemption, you wait a couple of weeks and then the IRB says, okay, then you take it to the analysts, you wait two weeks, then you go through that process. For us, you were already pre-approved. All you have to, because you've already agreed in general that you're not going to re-identify the data, et cetera, et cetera. And so the RRB has said, okay, if you do that in advance, we will give you automatic exemption for the data downloads. We did that at NIH as well. And the IRB likes it because it saves them work. Because they go to them and say, hey, listen, if somebody answered these questions this way, yes, 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 no, I promise, I promise, are you going to give them an exemption? They go, yes. I said, so why don't we automate it? And they said, okay. All right. So um, what that looks like is once you've gotten your summary data, you fill out this form and you basically say, what kind of data do you want? Who are you going to share it with? That's part of the exempt part of the um, data use agreement. And it has to be somebody who's had all the same training you did. So you put in what we call a blazer ID, which is like your university identifier. You put that in and a system will look up and say, oh, no, you can't share with that person because he hasn't done the, all the training. Or, yes, he's done the training and a limited data set, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get, um, you say what kind of data you want, and then you get a spreadsheet full of the, those data. These are just some other examples of the data. So, and there's, there are fake patient identifiers, but they carry across all the data sets that you download for that patient population. So you won't have any problem with, um, you know, matching the data and so on. Uh, the dates are real. All the other data are real. But it's all, you know, there's no text data. There are no uh, reports or anything like that that we have to worry about identifiers sneaking into the, into the results. Um, this is a little video, but I'm going to skip it. Or, well, maybe I can, I'll show the video and then jump ahead. It's going to let me do that. Is there a bar on there somewhere now? It's not letting me. Yeah. All right. Never mind. I'm not going to show it. Or maybe I have to. There we go. Um, and I would just show you the interaction with pulling up the form and, and, and how you would get it. So we've created a plugin that we're happy to share with other institutions and they can put it into their I2B2 system and, um, and, and do this and, and get your download. So that's so. The next thing we're working on is what we call to the IRB the Type Three fully identified data. So of course the IRB that's what they're there for, right? Is to protect uh, the patients from, uh, among other things, disclosure of confidential information, inappropriate disclosure. And so the first step has been to get the IRB to agree that research data could be put into I2B2. Now, you think that would be obvious, um, but they said, no, well, that makes it a research repository and you have to file a form with the IRB 
to get approval as a research repository. And I said, great, give me the form. And I said, we don't have one. Uh, use this other form. And the form was ridiculous because it says, how many subjects do you have? I don't, I, well, we either have a million or we have zero, depending on what you, because we're not asking any research questions. It's just a repository. I got past that eventually and they said, okay, you don't need approval for that. We'll give you a letter that says you don't need approval. But now, it, what the idea is that people, so now people can go into ITB2 and get data, identify data on their own research subjects um, on uh, their consented or, or, with, or with waiver of consent IRB approved studies. So we're now we've got to add a, uh, a module to allow them to actually do that. At the same time, we're trying to figure out how do we now make this shareable? So the AGHI project I mentioned doesn't do any actual research. It's just collecting information with the idea that other people would come and do research with the data and the patients, our patients in that project consent to that. We tell the, we say other people are gonna contact you to use your data, is that okay? And they say yes. So now I've got to get the IRB to agree that other people can go search those data. What are the requirements for the data collection and the consenting and all that stuff? And they, you know, they said that, so they said it would be an exempt proposal, um, but they decided they would have, a, or they're no, not exempt, they, what do they call it? Uh, uh, expedited, right? But only for me, they have the whole IRB meet to do what they call an expedited. Normally it's just the director of the committee or the, the chair of the committee. But not for me. For me, they, if I, my name was on a, an IRB proposal, I get the full treatment because they don't trust the computers. So, um, so I'm waiting here what they're going to say. I'm sure that the full committee will have questions because they won't understand it, and I'll have to go back and maybe even present to them or something, which, again, nobody else ever has to present to the IRB. But I did Columbia, NIH, UA, and UAB. They, they like to see my shining face to explain these computer things to them because they just don't get it. Okay, so then we have a lot of training stuff. Um, we have a homepage for people to go read about how to get to it. We have, you know, we have online manuals. They can go read about stuff. And we have a bunch of videos. And if you want to see them, uh, you can go to YouTube. And it's not .edu, it's .com. Uh, type in UAB I2B2, and you'll find our videos. Edith Burner made a whole bunch of very nice bite sides. How do you find a term? How do you do a search? Some of them are related to our version of I2B2, but most of them are generic. So uh, they might be useful for you. Those are, the, those are the videos. And then we have classes, and we have every, every, uh, every other two, Thursday uh, two-hour classes, and we tell people, you know, if you have a search that you want to do, do a, try it out first, get certified, try it out, then come to the class, learn how to really do it for the first hour. In the second hour, the analyst will stay there and work with you to help you do your search, and you may get your data uh, with the help of an analyst looking over your shoulder at that class. So that's been very popular. Uh, the other thing we did, and I don't have a slide for this, is to kind of boost interest and get people to notice I2B2, we sponsored a uh, an I2B2 abstract contest. And so the contest was simply go into I2B2, get a limited data set, write a one-page abstract. And you could have an extra page for, you know, graphs or data and references if you wanted. But really, a one-page abstract, that was it. $1,000 first prize two five hundred dollar second prizes that got a lot of attention the usage went way up uh and you know we and and we had we got some really good studies out of it um some of the people had cheated or not cheated but they didn't they they ignored the rule about not going to the analyst and getting help to get extra data uh and so the really good ones were the ones where they went to the analyst and they were just qualified because they weren't allowed they weren't supposed to do that they were supposed to just do it on their own so we're going to have another contest where we'll allow them to use the analyst because that actually produced better better um uh, results. But if you have a couple thousand dollars laying around and you're trying to get people to use I2B2, it, it gets a lot of attention. Uh, and I, at UAB, they're very, you know, it's a state institution, but they really relaxed about it. And because I said, I want to do this. And the, the lawyer said, well, thousand dollars, that's a lot of money. How about $500? I go, you know, there's something about that extra zero that gets attention. And they said, no, no, let's just do this. I'm mean, like, okay. And then some other office in the university had a contest, say it in six, it was called. And you, uh, six words, describe UAB in six words. And it was a $1,000 first prize. I said, hey, wait a minute. If they can do it, I can do it. I called them up and I said, so um, how'd you get permission to do this $1,000 prize? And they said, permission? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, what rules do you have about like the entries and you know how are you judging them? And they said rules, and I said okay, I'm just going to do this and, and I'll apologize later. And uh, it worked out fine, and, and nobody got bent out of shape about it. Okay, so this what am I showing here? This is 
Oh, this is okay. Just some screenshots of the way. Oh no, this is info buttons. I just so you know, I did info buttons at Columbia. I did them at NIH for researchers to be able to ask questions about data they were seeing. And I thought we'd play around with this, and uh, so we we created a plugin, and we don't actually have it in production. Um, but the idea is that you could you could when you download data, you use this special plugin to download the data, and displays it like that. So this is a uh, what are these? These are I think these are lab results. And um, or medications, yeah, those are medications. And then there's an info button next to each one, and you click on one, and it'll take you out and answer questions about that. So we have that plugin. The the, the coolest part about it is it's called I3B3 for info buttons for I2B2. So I3B3. And if you want to play around with it, we'll be happy to share that share that code. Now we're always looking to improve I2B2. And in fact, I come up with a bunch of ideas, and I go to a meeting with my my staff. And they go, oh, yeah, we're already working on that. And we have some better, even better ideas that we're working on. So I, it's even hard to keep up with all the things they want to do. We always trying to add more data uh, because we've got a big repository of data. It's got you know, free text notes, narrative text notes. So we want to get those in there in three forms. One is the raw text, which is surprisingly hard to get out of sermon because it's like an Easter egg hunt to go find. So they said, oh, get me the notes. So they bring me the notes, and I'm looking at this, and I go, that looks a little odd, this note. It just has an impression and plan in it. I go, well, maybe somebody just wrote it that way. But then all the notes look that way. And I said, okay, no, there are pieces of the note that you're not finding. And they go, oh, we don't know where they are. And Cerner sticks them off in some table. And you know, all, I don't know about, uh, uh, about Epic, but all scripts does the same thing. It's really hard to piece these things together. So we're working on that to get the text. Then we're going to do natural language processing on it to index them to find the named entities in the text, and then also do de-identification so you could go and actually download the DNFide reports. Although the changes to the common rule recently have made it so that <clears throat> you can get an exemption that allows you to get fully identified data if you protect it to the satisfaction of the IRB. So it's going to be another trip back to the IRB, but I'm going to try and convince them that we're, an environment I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is adequate to satisfy, automatically satisfy that exemption. And that'll mean that people can then go and download fully identified data uh, for reuse. Okay, the identify text and LM. One of the things that bugs me, I think for, every time I try to use I2B2, I can never find the terms. And you know, these are standard terminologies, and I'm supposed to be an expert on standard terminologies. I can never figure out if I got all the right terms or not. And you can do a text lookup. And it'll say there were more than 200 things, so here's the first 200, and you could select all those and, and get in a query that never completes because you've asked for all the records that have one of any of 200 things in it. Um, or you could walk down the hierarchy, but they're all strict hierarchy, so it's hard to find. You, you, you find some, I'll show you an example, and go, you wonder, did you find the right thing? So I'm trying, we're building better term lookup tools. We did some at NIH, and they were very effective, basically lexical lookup find all the terms, and then organize them into their own hierarchy so you can see, oh, here's you know 200 gout terms. If I pick this one, I'm going to get everything that's underneath it, and then I'll have to pick this other one and this other one, and then I'll have all the gout terms. So we're working on something like that, and that will be shareable and plug-in that anybody can use. And we also want to improve the, the, the data download. So you can say, look, I don't want all the labs. I want these specific labs uh, on, the, uh, on this cohort. So we're working on an interface for that. And uh, as I mentioned, it, adding in, uh, identified research data. So next thing I want to talk about is the accrual to clinical trials network. And I, you guys are members of that, right? Yes? I think pretty, I mean, a lot of play there. If you're not, you're on probably in route to it. So, um, and the thing they use, they have an ontology that's basically the ICD-9 hierarchy, the ICD-10 hierarchy, and then they have a merged hierarchy which is still a strict hierarchy, and I find it really hard to use. So there's ACT diagnoses, ICD-9, ICD-10 hierarchy, and this, is, I don't know if you can see, I think I circled it, so there it is. And I was interested, for instance, in gout. And gout, that's pretty simple, gout. I mean, we know what causes it, you know, we know what it does, it should be really simple to find all the gout terms. I wanna find all the people with gout. Well, in ICD-10, gout is considered an arthropathy, even if it doesn't involve the joints. In ICD-9, it's considered a metabolic disease, which is fine because that's what it is, but it's not under the joint diseases. So, uh, so they've chosen in the merge thing to put it under inflammatory polyarthropathies, and there's gout. And you go, great, I found it. I'm all done. Well, but there's acute gout, there's chronic gout, there's gouty attack, there's gout flare. So people that have those codes in their record also have gout. And so if I, my objective is to find all the people with gout, I'm going to have to include those things. And you can't even see what's down there. As I scroll down, 
So what I want to do, uh, so we've got, as I mentioned, we have a strict hierarchy. You don't know if you're getting all the terms you want, which is the whole point. Find me all the people that have this disease. And so what we are doing is building something at uh, the, at UAB that's based on work that I did at Columbia with the Medical Entities Dictionary and then at NIH with the Research Entities Dictionary, which is creating a control terminology that follows the desiderata, which has things like, well, they're concept-oriented. They're not, it's not about the name, the terms, it's about the concepts. So you can change the name of something as long as you don't change the meaning. And you can't change the name of something if it's going to change the meaning. And if you're familiar with ICD-9, ICD-10, CM updates, they do that all the time. Um, it's a multiple hierarchy. It has definitions. There's a lot of, that's a whole nother talk. But I did it at Columbia. It worked great. I did it again at NIH where I really had a problem with all the 27 different institutes sending me data with all their own terminologies. And now I want to do it at UAB, but I don't want to call it the Birmingham Entities Dictionary because it has a bad acronym. And so we're going to call it the UAB Foundational Ontology or UFO. And that's really good because it's the kind of thing nobody really knows what it is. Sometimes you see it and you're not sure what if you saw anything. It's a lot of, lot of myth about it. So UFO is actually a pretty good name for this. So we're starting to build a concept-oriented view of the terms from ICD-9 and ICD-10. We're using Apollon's distributed terminology services uh, to, to do that. And we're exploring now the use of Protege as, an, as another tool to help with this. So we started with, uh, this is myeloid leukemia. <clears throat> And if you, <clears throat> excuse me, look at how things are classified in ICD-9 versus ICD-10, they use different classifications based on different characteristics. And so, but we've created this little hierarchy. So you say, I want all the myeloid leukemias. You pick that and you'll get everything that is under there from, from uh, the different terminologies. Gout, however, is a little different. So there's diagnosis at the top and then there's gout. And then over there on the right, it says toxic effect. And you go down a couple levels and eventually you get to lead-induced gout. And uh, so that's under toxic effect. Um, these other things, some of them are under arthropathy, some of them are under metabolic, but that's the fully, the fully linked multiple hierarchy for gout. Now, you, we would never show anybody this. It's not really anything you could navigate. But if we create this in our hierarchy and then you say, get me all the patients with gout, you'll get all the people that have everything underneath there, which is what, really what you want. And so this is an example uh, hopefully I outlined it. So there's diagnosis ICD-10, ACT network. Um, this is in the ACT network. This is where gout is. So it's, it's, it's there. Um, and if you pick that, <clears throat> or sorry, that was the, no, that was the ICD-10 hierarchy. The, I already showed you the, IC, the merged hierarchy for ACT with all the other stragglers that were around. So I said, well, what if you just pick, use ICD-9, ICD-10? So this is ICD-10 gout. So he said, get me that. And then get me ICD-9 gout, which is under um, just metabolic disorder. So there's gout. And so you put those in there in I2B2. So you're basically saying, get, get me all the patients with either the ICD-10 term or the ICD-9 term or anything that's underneath it. And you get 16,895 patients. That's in our, in our um, at UAB. Now, we've created the UFO and we've added that to our, uh, to our, uh, IC, our local node. And if we say, okay, get me all the patients with gout here, that now subsumes that hierarchy I showed you. And so you just say, get me that, and now you get 19,000. So another 3,000 patients got picked up with this. Not only that, it was a lot easier to do that than it was to go hunt around for gout under these other things. Now, of course, it's at the top of the hierarchy, but it'll be a multiple hierarchy. So if you go down metabolic, you're going to find gout. If you go down under arthropathy, you're going to find gouty arthropathy, which if that's what you want, you'll find that class. All right, so this is why I'm telling you about this. So we're going to add this as an extension to our ACT Shrine node. And uh, they're very, the guys there, they're like, you're crazy. This is going to break everything. People will get upset. I said, I don't think so, because if they, they have no way at another site to send a query for these terms. So it will only break our queries against our own site, possibly, but hopefully it'll work. So the question, first question is, if we do that and we send that query out to the network, will it return data from UAB? It should. Now, because I don't, think the, the, I don't think the Shrine node has any kind of filter once you send the query out, but we'll find out. If it works, then if you add it to your Shrine node, can we get your data and can you get our data? Okay, and that'll be an interesting test. And, you know, we can pop it in there for five minutes, try it out, pull it back out again so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't break anything. Uh, nobody will know we did it. We'll do it in the middle of the night or the weekend or something. I'm sure there's a way to do this to test it. And if this works then we'll work on adding other domains. 
We'll start expanding that and finding a way to share that with the other ACT sites um, and with other sites, because frankly, everybody needs this, whether they're an ACT or not. Trying to find gout in that hierarchy is just a nightmare, and that's just one disease. Cancers are multiply classified. Every cancer is either in the in an organ system or it's in the cancer every infectious disease is either in the infectious disease tree or it's in an organ system and it needs to be in both if you really want to find this and try looking up tuberculosis sometime in icd-9 it's just it's all over the place now we're not doing this you know we're doing this with uh, our own resources but that's where the crowdsourcing comes in and so this isn't a real hashtag yet but it's going to be if this works and everybody uses it and goes, hey, Jim, we love gout, we love myeloid leukemia, what's next? I'll say, how about you guys work on one? And we find a way to crowdsource this and get people to contribute stuff to the version we're creating, and then we transfer that back out and hopefully help everybody who has, and, and work on domains that, you know, whatever is your priority, you can work on that, add it to the, to the, um, the crowdsourced version. So that's my, sort of my goal to try to make this happen. I tried to get a grant to do this. See, uh, NCATS did not understand it. I went to a meeting and met with them and talked to them about it, and they still didn't, they didn't understand why this would be important. Um, so we just have to show them because then, well, then it'll be really easy because I'll say, okay, here's our test. Okay, half the group has the codes, half of them has the regular codes. Go find me all the patients with gout. That's the, the question. How long did it take you to generate the query? How many patients did you find? The answer to those questions, <clears throat> excuse me, will tell us whether this is going to work or not. Okay, next thing. How are we doing on time? Good on time. All right, so the next thing is this thing called Ubright that we're, that's under development now at UAB. For the life of me, I can't tell you what it stands for, but I know the U stands for UAB. B is biomedical. R is something about research, and IT is probably information technology or informatics technology or something. But basically, the idea is to create an environment that's going to support translational uh, science across the spectrum for team-based research. So it used to be in the old days, if you wanted to do a study for antibiotics, you'd find some fungus and you would grow some bacteria and see which bacteria were you know, sensitive to the fungus. You'd make a pill, you would give it to people, um, and then you would, if it worked, you gave it to the population. So that was my, this is my view of medical research, uh, you know, pretty, pretty simplistic. But that's, you know, that's the way it worked. My father was in medical research. There was no IRB. There were no P values. You know, you just did it and see if it worked. And if it worked, you did it. It was great. All right. Well, of course, now it's a little more complicated. We start looking at the genetics of the bacteria. We start looking at the, the, um, the, uh, how the organism is infecting the person. Uh, we have electronic health records. So we're pulling data from their electronic health record available. We have images and other signals on these patients. We have um, the genetics of the patient, and we can start looking at their genes and the transcription and the gene expression. And then we look at the, 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 um, the biologic pathways affected by changes in their, in their genome. And we look at the population to see which genes are in the population. We start looking at the genetics of the organism, you know, and as if that wasn't enough, then we start looking at the genetics of the organisms in your gut and on your skin and other places, you know, the, epi, the epigenome. So, um, now it's a lot more complicated. Now, in all of this, there are researchers. So here's my researchers. Maybe you'll recognize yourself in one of these icons. And so the researchers are all off there working on different pieces, right? And so one, you know, they have they have pipelines and they say, oh, here's my data. I'm going to give it to you. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of mayhem. So the idea is to figure out how we connect all these people together and coordinate what they're doing. All right, and so that's what Ubright is supposed to do. So, for example, the analyst, that's not a researcher there, the, the guy sitting at the computer with the yellow, whatever it is, oval behind him, he's an, he's an analyst, he works for me, but I want to make him part of the team. I want him to be part of the research team and be in on the communication with the team so that as they're getting data, he can say, hey, here's other data we can contribute or here's what I can do to help filter it and you know search it and so on so that's what you is supposed to be is the place where we bring all these people together my idea was pretty simple because i was looking at things that were out there and you know things like transmart and other i would talk to researchers you and say hey how come you're not using transmart and they go oh it looks pretty good maybe somebody would use it but i won't use it and i'm like why not well because it doesn't do exactly what i want and you know, I need to do some other things and I like my own pipelines and, and I couldn't get any excitement about these other tools that are out there. So I said, well, let's, you know, there, let's create our own environment and see if we can make something that really works for folks. And so we've got impact and we've got I2B2 and all these data sources that come into those, those things. 
and connections out to the other networks. Then we've got high performance computing and we've got a genomic, genomic data storage for that. And we've got data sources that come into that. And there isn't really a good connection between that. But of course, in translational science, you want a connection between that. Um, and so that's where uh, we're going to bring you, you bright in. Now, one of the problems is all these people working with de-identified genomic data think it's really de-identified. And they think that HIPAA doesn't apply to what they're doing, but they're wrong. And so they, they're off there very cavalierly, you know, working in the high performance computing environment, which is not a HIPAA compliant environment. I want to be able to have uh, shared expertise among the teams and across teams so that when somebody creates a pipeline, for something, they could put it in a library and say, yeah, I'm happy to share that. It gets indexed and somebody else comes along and said, hey, are there any pipelines that anybody's done that does this and this and this? And we'll, they'll be able to find it. Um, and we want to share data sets as well so that somebody goes out and brings in a big national data set and goes through all the hoops of bringing the data in and gets it set up. Then somebody else can say, hey, do we have this data set? And yeah, you have it. Here's how you get permission to use it if that's necessary. But then once it's there, they've, they've already, it's already there and available to use. And then coordinating the teams. So the, the Ubright solution, pretty simple. Um, give them clinical data, access to clinical data, storage computing, protect the health information, and then give them tools that let them collaborate. Um, so where are we here? Here we go. So, <clears throat> so then we just add this thing. This is Ubright, and it, can, it sort of uh bridges each of these big resources and then puts team management tools in the center project management tools in the center um, and then we can start bringing in our natural language processing tools and uh and some of the other things that we're creating so let me show you what we've where we've gotten so far so the way we did this again i can never get anybody to do anything at uh, uab unless i pay them to do it now, sometimes it's with food, and you guys are sitting here partly because there's free food over there. So it works. It's very effective. And Clem knew about that, about pizza, right? Clem always talked about having pizza for things. Well, I give $1,000 pizzas. And so that's I had the abstract for I2B2, and I said, you know what I need? I need researchers who are going to help me understand what their needs are. And if I go ask them, they're going to just say some minimal thing or say something they think I'm going to want to hear, and I'm not going to really get to it. So why don't I sponsor some of their research? But in the process, they have to work with my team to create the prototype of Ubright that will work with their data. And they, I put out an RFP in, in March 2018, and I said, if you have a project that involves genomic data, and either you either have phenomic, that is clinical data, or you need cl clinical data from, U, from I2B2 or the, or the repository, the warehouse, um, apply to do this project, and I will fund two people, uh, some percentage, 20%, for six months. And I got a bunch of applicants, and I picked four of those, and uh, and then those people worked on these projects for six months with our team going, wait, here's an environment you can do this, in. and they have to you, you have to use our environment. They mostly what they did was work with um, uh, um, what's it called, um, Jupyter notebooks. You know, that started the, that was the idea. It's like, why can't everybody just, you know, you put yours in here. So we had recent, we, you know, the head research is like, I don't understand R and I don't understand Python. I don't understand, uh, you know, any of this stuff. Um, but I want to see the data. I want to see graphs. They go, fine. So they, the analysts put it in, they do the thing, and then they, the, the head researcher looks at the graph and goes, oh, that's what I want. That's not what I want. Okay, now do this next. And then they go in and they add things to the notebook. And he can periodically look at the flow and go, okay, great. And you can see what's happening. We, we set that up. We got a good understanding of their data. And then we brought all the groups in for a three-day hackathon where we forced them all to sit together for uh, it was like two and a half days uh, to, to get everything working. And they talked about their pain points and the things that were working for them. We got them connecting their clinical and genomic data in a secure environment where they could work on it. And um, we got figured out data governance policies that would manage the things they're doing. And we brought people together. This, this funny blue screen is actually a screen capture because some of the people were coming in um, from uh, via a WebEx. Um, but we had, you know, lots of people working together. There's food there, and you can see we brought in food, get everybody working. And at the end of the three days, they had really had something to show for all four projects. And you can go to the Ubright site and see this. So Ubright has consists of data portal, which is, I don't know why they call it that, because it also has source code. So that's where all the, the digital stuff is. It's clinical data, access to omics data, and then any pipelines or other code they want to share. 
And then we have the analysis gateway, and that's really access to the high-performance computing, uh, the project management software we created, which is pretty, pretty simple. I'll show you a screenshot of that. And then um, the Jupyter Notebooks, and then access to high-performance computing and cloud resources. And then we have an expo gallery where they post, the, post, post their projects. So I think I have a URL here somewhere. Uh, and I'll get to it. This is our homepage, ubright.informatics.uab.edu. No hyphen in Ubright. Uh, and you'll get to this page and you'll be able to see some of the things anyway. So this is the, uh, you go in, if, you, if you're a user, you log in, you can see the projects you're involved in. Um, you can create a project. You can assign an owner and other people to your project team. And then you can um, add different resources, programs, so on that, that are part of that project team. And then they basically use the Jupyter Notebooks to actually do some to actually you know, operationalize things. And then our expo gallery, I don't begin to understand all the all the, the science behind it. I'm not, I was a biologist back when there was only DNA and RNA, and that was kind of it. Uh, now it's I can't even keep up with all the all the additions. Um, but um, we have a project on uh, sequencing in glioblastoma, another project in precision oncology, in which they're sequencing the tumors and the patients, figure out toxicities of, of appropriate uh, therapies. Uh, we have a project on uh, lupus and another project in rheumatoid arthritis. So lots of different, lots of variety. Uh, and, um, and, and they met my goal of creating a, a sort of first version of Ubright that we could say, okay, you can go in there, create projects, and you have a secure environment for your genetic data and your clinical data. And um, you know, now we gotta make it more usable. But the Alabama Genome Health Initiative that I mentioned before with the 10,000 patients and the sequence data is the first uh, step in there that, that, that is now using the first version of Ubright. That system has a population cohort and they do have a genotyping array. And then they also, when they find infected subpopulation people who are affected by genetic disease, they do whole genome sequencing on those people and return results as appropriate. Um, and that's a map of Alabama. And that there's one county they didn't have somebody in there as of uh, April, but I understand the last month they finally got somebody in that county down there, and um, and so they they're finding whoops sorry they're finding uh, they were wondering what you know the 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 um, American College of Genomic Medicine predicts somewhere between one one and two percent of people have an actionable actionable variant in their genome, and we actually found 1.4 percent in the population that we were studying, so it was pretty much in line with what we thought, and. Um, I'll share these slides later. For, I mean, they're on here. You can free to take them, um, but they're, they've got all kinds of samples. I think we're about half done, almost half done with collecting the 10,000 uh, subjects. So AGHI data going into I2B2. Now, not all the patients in AGHI are, are UAB patients, but a lot of them are. Uh, and so the ones that are either because we're doing a lot of recruitment in Birmingham or because a lot of people from Alabama come to, come to UAB for at least some of their care. So we have electronic health record data on something like two thirds of the patients so far. So if you wanna do a genome wide association study, you go into I2B2, you say, find me all the patients that are in AGHI. And then you, then you say, all right, now find me the ones that have a certain diagnosis, find me the ones that don't have that diagnosis. And now you've got your cases and controls and you can download uh, demographics, medications, diagnoses, labs, and then you go to the IRB and get permission to get access to the rest of the data, and you can then go and get the variants and text reports. And I tell people when they do this, do not put my name on the IRB proposal because they will cause problems. Just say you're going to go and get a AGHI data. You don't even have to say I2B2. You just say you're going to get the data, and they'll go, and you show them consent form for AGHI, and they say, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's legitimate, and you can get your data. So, so far we have one project that's managed to do that successfully. Now, if you wanna do a phenome-wide association study, now you start with a variant. You start AGHI patients, find me all the ones that have this variant, find me all the ones that don't have this variant, and then you can go and uh, do the same thing, get your downloads. And so that's the self-service part. And right now, um, once you've got your IRB approval, then the analysts will get the data for you. But as I mentioned, we're working on the adding the module that will let you get your own data as well. So this is just a query for, uh, this is how you find all the patients that have um, diabetes in the AGHI uh, initiative. So the first thing you do is say, get me people who have any AGHI data. Then you say, get me any of the people who either have diabetes with complications or diabetes without complications. And that's 788 patients. And then you can say, get me all the AGHI patients who, who do not have, that is, are excluding um, patients with 
diabetes with complications and excluding people with diabetes without complications, and you get 3,400 uh, 3, patients. So that's how you get your, you get your cohorts. And then, and then you go in and you download, you can get case report form data. So that's the case report form data that's collected in the, in the study. And you can say, oh, I want variant data. And you get your variant data. And it's, you know, it's as easy as getting a bunch of lab data. We just treat it all the same. So far, we haven't hit any performance problems. We'll see what happens. All right, so that's Ubrite. And next steps in Ubrite is we're adding text de-identification to make it easier for people to use those tools to, to work with the data, uh, NLP for named entity extraction. And uh, we have a self, we have a tool for uh, creating health disease, uh, creating disease registries. It's called uh, feeders for phenome health data registry, something like that. And basically you say it creates a virtual uh, 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 disease registry based on our data. And what you can do is when you create the registry, then you can have an alert in the clinical system that says, hey, if this person has a clinic visit I, in the next two weeks and he's in the repository, he's in the registry, let me know so I can go and set up a clinic appointment, meet with him, see if he wants to enroll in my study, that kind of thing. What we want to do is make that self-service. Right now you have to go to John Osborne and say, could you please build me a feeder's registry for this disease and meet these criteria? And he'll do it, but he's backlogged. But we want to make it self-service. So you go and create your own. So that's another, another project. I mentioned the geocoding. We've done some of that. And the, you know, the people that want this data or say they want it have told us they have a huge list of things they want us to do. Oh, do this, do this, put it all in there. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll do all that. We're going to do some of it and then we'll see what they use. And if they use it, great. And if they don't use it, we'll say, all right, at least we didn't do everything and waste a lot of time. Probably what they'll do is they'll use some of it, and then we'll figure out the other part that they really need, and then we'll work on that next. So that's that's coming. And then we want to expand. We want to share all these resources, including Ubrite, whatever we develop for Ubrite, and make that um, shareable uh, through um, GitHub and, and other mechanisms. So the vision will be to let the teams become greater than the sum of their parts, because now we bring in people who uh, are communicating at a level that they did not do, do so before. Um, we're we're going to have these shared uh, with scarce resources, um, bioinformatics analysts. You know, they're in short supply. Everybody's they're always wanting me to to hire more analysts and pay for them out of my own budget. Um, but we got to find a way to make extend their use, make them more efficient as part of the team. And also find ways to make some of the move some of the analytic tasks onto the researchers and make the bioinformatics analysts do the more you know work at the level of their their training. Um, we need to make our researchers compliant with privacy laws, and I'm not publicly stating that we're not compliant, but we certainly have an environment that allows people to be non-compliant, and so we need to uh, we need to make sure it's easy for them to to follow the rules and the laws. And um, we're making this available to our CCTS. Uh, CTSA program partners. So our Center for Clinical Translational Science is a hub for a whole bunch of other institutions, 11 other institutions in the Southeast. And so the idea will be that anybody who's a researcher at any one of those things will be able to use Ubrite just as if they were at UAB. So we want to lower all those barriers to the extent possible. And then, we'll, as I mentioned, we'll make the code shareable. Okay, and then the last thing I want to talk about is ACRU, is ACRU or ACRU, which is authoring criteria for research eligibility wizard, which is a is an awkward name, but it has a great acronym, which is ACRU, because it's something that will help you accrue patients to your uh, clinical study. So the problem that we're trying to fix is that the authoring of criteria for clinical trials right now is kind of a an ad hoc thing. The researchers sit down and kind of describe their ideal subjects. And they say, you know, we want people with no lung disease. What, the, what does that mean, no lung disease? Does that mean, you know, is lung cancer a lung disease? Is it, you know, how, what do we call a lung disease? And these criteria get reused in a lot of places. They're used in planning the research. They're used in execution of the research. They're in the, they're in the consent forms. They're in the IRB protocol. They're in clinicaltrials.gov. And they're instructions to the, re, to the research team. So these criteria are all over the place. But they're not written in a way that makes them implementable. They're written by the people who are dreaming up, what disease do I want to cure? What, you know, what Nobel Prize am I trying to win? Um, but they're not written with, OK, so the first step is to figure out who in I2B2 is eligible for this study. They don't think about how the criteria map to a query in I2B2, and that causes a lot of trouble. Um, 
there's a lot of assumption that the OMOP data model, all you have to do is turn, take the criteria, do some NLP and turn it into an OMOP query and you're done and you'll have be able to find all your patients. And it's just not the case. The criteria turn out to be incredibly complicated. Oh, they have to have this many things and they can't have had this drug within the last four half lives of, you know, whatever. I mean, the criteria can be really complicated and it's impossible to imagine being able to automate that whole thing and do it against some data model like OMOP or I2B2. Um, so the idea is what if we could walk the researchers through the process of writing the criteria and so they go, yeah, we want patients who um, have this disease and they have this level of kidney function and they speak English and they're, yeah, whoa, whoa, hold on, slow down. Do you have any other lab things? Do you have any other diseases? Are there anything you want to exclude? Get them to think logically through the process in a way that's going to be easy to then translate to the actual oper operationalization of the process. So um, the, the current state is you got researchers, they write these criteria, then they have to go back and rewrite them over and over to, as they figure things out, they go to the institutional review board, they discuss it with them, eventually they come decide what's gonna be approved. They go to the database analyst and say, hey, find me all the patients that meet these criteria. And like, really patients, you know, you want me to find patients that have had chest pain for less than 30 minutes? Um, you know, how am I going to do that in a repository that's refreshed once a month? So, you know, they have to figure out which things can they actually do. So they have to talk with them. Um, they have to put this in clinicaltrials.gov to help with recruitment. Um, then they, the analysts find, do their cohort query and they go against the repository. They find a, a general population, their subpopulation. And now the enrollment staff has to go to those people and see if they really meet the criteria. So what is the enrollment staff going to do that's different than what the analysts did? Which part of that? Find out if they speak English. Find out if they're willing to stop, you know, taking their medications for a week while they're on a study. Find out if they can understand a consent form. Those are not things you're going to figure out from a clinical data repository. Um, then you get your study cohort, and so you have your research data, and now you have your research analyst. That analyst needs to know what to, has to understand the criteria that were used to enroll the patients because they influence the study. They can bias the study. Um, it's a limited subset. It's not the general population. So they need to understand that um, when they're writing a paper. And then somebody who's doing a meta-analysis also needs to understand that if they're going to bring that paper in and conclude it in their meta-analysis. And then maybe most importantly, we want to operationalize this for patient care. So we have clinical practice guidelines and we have, um, you know, uh, we have clinicians who are trying to apply those guidelines, and then they may want to look at the paper and go, is there a paper that supports this drug for this, you know, my patient? Um, what were the enrollment criteria for the study? Do those enrollment criteria have anything to do with the patient that I'm trying to treat? Or if there's conflicting evidence, which article is most relevant to my patient? So the, those criteria come in all the time in the process, or at least they're supposed to. So what we want to do is have uh, a crew be a pro something that will walk you this, through this step of creating formal a formal set of criteria. And we can have a criteria library, so you can go, well, I want all the patients that have this disease. Let me see what other people did. What criteria did they use? And I can just pull those in. Not only does it make it easier, maybe it'll make me be able to compare my results with the other studies done from, from those other criteria. Then I think it'll be really easy to generate the languages needed to put in the IRB protocol to explain the recruitment criteria. That's not, you know, natural language generation is kind of bland, but it works. It's, very, it's pretty easy to do. So now you do that, and uh, hopefully they understand it. You can submit that to the clinicaltrials.gov, and you can maybe even generate an automated query. Uh, and at least some of the steps, it should be pretty easy to take the queries and say, oh, here are the parts that are lab results, and here are the parts that are diagnoses, and turn that into something that you can uh, initially find a set of of um, subjects. You might need to go to the database analyst, but maybe we can now make those instructions clearer to something the analyst would understand. And they, and now we have an honest broker who needs to go and look at the record and say, okay, now I have those instructions for how do I pick, how do I filter these people down? For instance, um, we need people who have this diagnosis for more than 10 years. Uh, but, you know, the record only goes back eight years. So now what do we do? Well, a human being goes and looks at the record and reads the text to see if anywhere it says, this patient has had this disease for 15 years. And then, aha, okay, they fit the cohort. And then finally, we can give instructions, clear instructions to 
the enrollment staff that's not all the criteria. So they go, hey, do you have a creatinine greater than two? Or no, we've already done that part. Here's the part you need to ask the, the patient. Do they understand English? Are they willing to do this? Are they willing, you know, uh, can they understand the, con the consent form and so on? And so we can reuse those criteria by writing them back out into a language that each recipient will understand. Mm -hmm. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Hopefully it will the, to the uh, NCATS review uh, group that's panel that's meeting, it's either this week or next week. It's an example of a bunch of criteria and I won't go through them all, but it's things like, you know, the age, uh, COP defined by the gold criteria, whatever those are, you need to know, well, it's this ICD-9 code or this ICD-9 code, but they have to have an FEV of less than 0.7 and, and so on. So how do you, um, you know, you would say, okay, the analyst, for the analyst, just find people with this ICD-9 code. And then for the chart review person, go and read the, the, uh, the, um, you know, pulmonary uh, function tests reports and see if the patient has an FEV of less than 0.7. And now at the interview point, somebody's just going to verify the criteria. Uh, let's take another one. There's, uh, let's see, clinically stable in the last four weeks with no evidence of COPD exacerbation. Well, so what's, you know, what's the patient, how do you query for patients that, that don't have any disease? That's not, that's going to be hard for the analyst to figure out. Um, it's going to be hard also in the chart review, right? Because, you know, you need to go and talk to the patient. Hey, how have you been feeling for the last four weeks? Do you have COPD uh, and so on? So that's, um, it's a, uh, and they can have COPD, but not an ex exacerbation. So we can break these up into different uh, tasks and make them much more sensible for each person that actually has to interpret. Okay, so clinical research informatics research means that we are looking at, for in this case, clinical and translational scientists have diverse information needs and studying what those needs are and building tools to help, uh, help uh, address those is an informatics research topic and it's clinical research, informatics research. And so we're looking at how we can empower team science, which is the new buzzword, team science. Everybody's doing that with enhancing I2B2, make it easier for them to do self-service data queries, uh, better ontologies for a better tomorrow. So help, hopefully helping people find the right terms and the terminology so they're getting what they think they're, they should be getting. Um, building this collaborative workspace uh, with secure computing, and that's Ubright, and then other tools for improving research design and extraction execution, including uh, Accrue. And I think that's it. And so don't forget to text that number you have to text at the end of the thing for your CME credit. Um, and I'm, I have a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to stay afterwards for questions. So, um, you showed, what about the biobank uh, connections uh, there? What are your... Okay, so we have a biobank, um, and um, we what we do is we bring, in, it's our, we're using... Um, uh, I'm blanking on the, term, on the name of the system at the moment, but we we use it also for uh, case control or for uh, clinical research uh, data management system. So it has case report forms, that kind of stuff in it. And so we, so, yes, Encore, thank you. So we bring so we bring those data into I two B two. So we register in I two B two the fact that this patient has a specimen. If they are not a UAB patient, because sometimes we just get the specimens, we don't have the whole patient, we can register those as well. We make up a, a patient identifier for it. Um, if they're de-identified and if they're not supposed to be linked to the health record, again, we can we can make that. So you can go in and say, find me all the people that have, you know, uh, a liver cancer biopsy. And, and it'll tell you, um, you know, who those people are. And then you can find out from the report, from the data you get, who the researcher is that would give you permission to get access to the data. Now, the other thing we're doing is we're bringing in data from the other uh, CCTS partners, and they, they are having trouble releasing detailed data about their specimen collections for whatever reason. I said, you don't have to give me detailed data. Just tell me what specimens this study has and how many, and we'll create a record for each of those specimens and, you know, and then you can go and search on those and it'll say, well, there's 13 people that are, you know, have this specimen and they're at Louisiana State University and here's the person you contact. So we can create a virtual biobank this way, even though we don't have any specific data. And of course, the more they can tell us about the patients, the better search they can do. But they can at least find out, oh, there's a bunch of liver cancer specimens at, at this guy's lab in LSU. Let me call him up, see if he'll share them. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jim, for, for, the, 
for showing us all that you are we are doing there. So it's very interesting for empowering the team science, as you mentioned. Uh, I have a question for you regarding the the I2B2 data um, uh, release for investigators. You mentioned that they can just fill out that form, right, for uh, LDS. Right. And uh, so, and then you get a spreadsheet, right? Right. Is it your IRB or your group are concerned about where they are going to retrieve that spreadsheet? For instance, they may be working from home and then relieving the spreadsheet at home with all the PHI information there because LDS does have some PHI. Uh, how does your IRB and your group uh, think about that? So, so the IRBs generally assume, for better or worse, that when a researcher does the training and passes the test and gets certified, that they will behave appropriately. Because there's no other way to, there's no other assumption you can make. I mean, you, you, you can't, they'll say they're going to download it. And then of course they put it on a laptop and leave it in the trunk of their car. And it's an unencrypted hard drive. And you know, these stories happen all the time. That's not just about I2B2 data, limited data sets. It's any limited data set. So their attitude is, if you say you're going to protect these data, then we believe you. Now, the thing that, that, um, uh, with the with Ubright is that we're going to be able to allow them to certify a little better that they're going to behave because we're going to provide them a secure environment in which to store the data and a secure environment in which to analyze or you know do computing on the data so that they won't have to put it on their laptop and leave it in the trunk of their car uh, and so we hope that'll you know just by default they'll be following the rules better. So that's but the the IRB says if you've agreed to this we're going to believe that you're going to follow the rules. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask you the following question. What's the connection to you, Bright? You already answered. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much.